Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Be Well, Be Keto. And today I am super excited to interview Carrie Brown. Yes, I know most of you probably totally know her and love her because she has the ketogenic kitchen. She's a cookbook author with her famous ice cream recipes. She's been a podcast co-host among so many other things and a pastry chef. Oh my gosh, I would die if I was a pastry chef. Anyways, today we talk about Carrie and her struggle with bipolar disorder, and this is part one of a two-part interview because we ran out of time, but we have so much more to talk about. So I was really blown away by how deep Carrie went to actually heal her disease and to really, we really want to work on overcoming the stigma that comes with mental disorders or brain disorders. I think we got a really good start here. So I hope you enjoy the show. Let's go say hi to Carrie. Welcome to the Be Well, Be Keto podcast, where we showcase ordinary people who have achieved extraordinary results. Your host is the high energy girl, Tracy Gluheit. Give a woman a fish, feed her for a day. Teach a woman to fish, feed her for a lifetime. Teach a woman to teach a woman to fish, and world hunger. Have you ever wanted to help people improve their health journey? Have you thought about coaching people with a keto lifestyle? Would you like to become an integrative health coach? Well, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, or IIN as we call it, is the largest nutrition school in the country. And in 2011, I graduated from their program and became a health coach. It was completely awesome. We learned over a hundred different dietary theories and talk about craziness and confusion. My wish for you is that we can lock arms and create a tribe of health coaches all around the country, all around the world to spread the keto message. If this resonates with you and you would like to look into this option deeper, please go to my blog at highenergygirl.com and click on the link to the right of the homepage. Here you can grab the curriculum guide and see if it inspires you. Since I care so much about my listeners, I negotiated the very best tuition rate for you at IIN. Either you can contact them directly and give them my name, or I will introduce you to a counselor so you can decide if this is a good fit for you and your career goals. Let me know how I can support you in this coaching career opportunity. This podcast contains the opinion and thoughts of its host and guests. It is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subjects covered. All statements made on the podcast have not been evaluated by the FDA and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. If the listener requires professional assistance or advice, please contact your personal medical doctor. Both host and guests specifically disclaim any responsibility for any liability, loss, or risk personal or otherwise, which is incurred as a consequence directly or indirectly of the use and application of any of the contents of these episodes. Like I said, this is my opinion and I could be wrong. Hey, Carrie, thanks for coming on the show today. Hi, Tracy. How are you? I am doing well. I can't complain. It was 79 degrees here today, so pretty it good. Was, uh, it was not that hot in Connecticut, but it was gloriously blue and sunny and sparkly and the fall colors, and it was gorgeous, but it wasn't 79. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I just was born here, so I'm stuck with it. You know, what can I say? So for the listeners, Carrie, if there's maybe one that doesn't know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So... I am not from here, which you may have already surmised. Um, I was born in England, and I spent some time there. And then I got the travel bug, and um, after training to be a pastry chef at the London Bakery School, which is part of uh, South Bank University in London, I traveled around. I lived in Canada for a while working as a pastry chef. I lived in Perth, Western Australia working as a pastry chef. And then I came back to London and taught at the National Bakery School, uh, taught chocolate and patisserie and pastry work and all of that fun stuff um, for a while. And then... um, I kind of I moved into sales actually which was which was odd 
mostly because in England at the time to become to have your own business as a pastry chef would have cost a staggering amount of money, which I didn't have. And I found it incredibly frustrating working for other people because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And so the standard that they required was always lower than the standard I could produce. So instead of um, being frustrated at not ever being stretched in my job, and because I couldn't afford to open my own operation, I stepped out of production and moved into sales. So I had a glorious few years selling chocolate to the top pastry chefs, uh, uh, the length and breadth of England, uh, mostly in London. I used to swan around all the swanky hotels in London, visiting all the pastry chefs and having them make me hot chocolate and feed me things in the kitchen. So that was super fun. Um, So I did that for quite a while. And then um, I actually moved out of sales altogether. And and it looked for a while like my my culinary years were over. Um, So fast forward a few years and I decided to, I'd, I'd moved to America by that point, and I decided to start a food blog, and it was restaurant reviews. And I started doing restaurant reviews for restaurants in Seattle, Washington, where I was living at the time, and had a ton of fun um, doing that. And in that process, I suddenly realized that I no longer had any control. I no longer appeared to have any control over my own body. Up until that point, I'd always been, I was naturally skinny. I was like 119 pounds. It just, it didn't matter what I ate. I ate what I wanted. I was just 119 pounds. And, you know, I was bombing around. And then one day I kind of woke up and looked in the mirror and went, okay, whose body is that? Because it doesn't look like mine. <laughs> and, 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 and then I kind of got on this journey where it didn't matter what I ate or how much or how little I exercised, I could not lose weight. So the, I had the opposite problem. All of a sudden, it felt like overnight I'd gone from couldn't could eat what I wanted and it, I never gained weight, and then it kind of suddenly flipped to it didn't matter – how much or how little or what I ate, I couldn't lose weight. I call that hormone hell. <laughs> right. So I went on this little roller coaster, uh, fired quite a few doctors who, when I went to see them, and I said, you know, there's something wrong because I can't lose weight. I, you know, so I, I bike ride, I cycle 10 miles a day, I eat lettuce for three months and I've lost no weight there's something going on there's something wrong like we can you help me figure out what it was and and this one doctor said to me well it's calories in calories out it's like thermodynamics and I'm like oh okay uh I kind of feel like I've proved it isn't because I've cycled for three months and eaten lettuce and nothing's changed but okay (laughs) he said um drink slim fast for 10 days that's all. Just keep up your cycling and then drink slim fast for 10 days. And I think a whole day's worth of slim fast is like 480 calories. So he said, drink slim fast for 10 days, cycle the same. In 10 days, you'll have lost 10 pounds and you'll feel like you're back in control of your body. So I'm like, so off I go. And I chuck down slim fast for 10 days and I keep up the exercise and nothing happened. So after 10 days, I go back to him and I'm like, um, nothing happened. And he said, it's thermodynamics, calories in, calories out. And I'm like, but I just proved it's not. He's like, no, it's thermodynamics. And I said, look, my cat can tell you that it's not. <laughs> and he's like, but it is, it's thermodynamics. So I fired him. And then I went on this journey of trying to discover, like, what 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 is wrong with this? And I came across the book, uh, why we get fat and what to do about it by Gary Taubes. And I kind of, I read it in, I inhaled it. I read it in like two days and I immediately stopped eating all carbs and went and started eating protein and fat. And it was miraculous. I lost my muffin top in like three days. 
it was it was just it was seriously it was like weird and so that was super cool but then it I, I stalled so immediately I had all these great results but then it just kind of stopped where it was and didn't didn't keep going and then I ran into a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Baylor and he was launching a program this was years ago called Sane, which was a diet that was developed around food quality. So it was, and it was kind of the concept that that it matters what you eat, not so much how much of it, um, it not calories in, calories out, but it doesn't really matter how many calories you eat as long as they're of the right things. And so, and his approach was kind of higher protein, lower healthy fat, um, non-starchy, but a lot of non-starchy vegetables. So 10 servings of non-starchy vegetables a day, higher protein, lower fat. So I did that for a while. And as a result of that, I decided to start blogging food recipes. So that's really when my, my blog took off and I started developing recipes again. So I, I kept doing like the low carb and that was okay to a point. But what brought me to keto was five years ago, five and a half years ago now, um, I had a mental break. I had depression my whole life. Um, but I'd kind of managed it. I'd had times where I was put on antidepressants for a while and then times where I just lived with it. But I'd had this this recurring depression for my whole life. I was born with depression. I'd never really known any different. And you just learn how to live with it. But five and a half years ago, I actually had a mental break. And as a result of that, I was... Uh, diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder. What's that? What's that mean? What I've never heard of that. So bipolar 2 disorder used to be called manic depression. Um, and bipolar, there's different flavors of bipolar. So bipolar 1 disorder is where you have extended periods of mania. So mania looks like driving 90 in a 30 spending $50,000 in a weekend of money that you don't have, you know, sleeping anything, sleeping with anything that stands still long enough, kind of crazy behavior, the stuff you see in the news, this really manic behavior. They, bipolar, people with bipolar one, they have big periods of manic behavior punctuated by much shorter, less intense periods of depression. Bipolar two people, of which I am one, we have extended periods of intense depression punctuated by short periods of not manic behavior, but what they call hypomania. Hypomania for me looks like uh, writing a cookbook in five weeks. Um, super productive, incredibly focused, just like periods of being superwoman. But most of the time, it's in this very intense depression. So they call it bipolar because you flip between one state and the other. There's also bipolar, which is called rapid cycling, where you switch between the two states very, very quickly. Um, so that's kind of what bipolar is. And I was diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder. And the followed... Um, and I was put under the care. The only reason I was allowed out of the hospital was because I agreed to uh, go under psychiatric care. And so there followed this merry-go-round of doctors and psychiatrists and, and pills while they were trying to figure out what medication worked for me to keep me stable. And the first thing they gave me, I don't remember which one it was, but they gave me something which literally turned me into a zombie. And I basically slept for two weeks. And I'm like, you know, I'm a single girl and I've got to pay the bills and this is not working. Like, like you know, be, being bipolar was better than this because at least I could function to some level. 
Anyway, we went through about, I want to say five different medications before we found some where I could actually get up and function to a degree. Um, but nine months after my mental break, and despite the fact that I was on um, a variety of medications to help with my mood stability and my mood swings, I became suicidal. And I remained suicidal for eight months. And so I spent eight months where every waking minute, my brain was trying to kill me. I actually had to tie, I was put on medical leave because I mean, I just, I, I couldn't function properly. I was very lucky to have a very good job in corporate America that actually allowed me to take a medical leave. Um, but I spent eight months um, wanting to die. At the end of that eight months, um, I, I found a new doctor who asked me to try something called Lamotrigine, which is actually an anti-seizure medication. And so we put me on Lamotrigine, and three days later, it was like somebody had switched the light on. It was just like for the first time in my life, I felt joy. I knew what joy was. And I was just like, this is a miracle. And so for six months, life was glorious. And then after six months, I became suicidal again. Well, their response to that was to double the dose of the lamotrigine. And the joy returned. So I was like, great. And that went on for another six months. And then I became suicidal again. And at that point, their response was to double the dose. And I'm like, I, I can't. I can't spend my life going through these periods where I randomly become suicidal I mean, because I might actually kill myself, right, if I'm not in the right place or someone's not there or whatever, I could actually kill myself. So one, I don't want to deal with that. But also, I can't spend the rest of my life with you just putting me on increasingly large doses of this thing that's messing with my brain. And, of course, there's the side effects of taking medications like that as well. And and so I kind of set everybody down, my psychiatrist and doctors and, and everybody, and I said, nobody's asking the critical question. Nobody. All you're doing is giving me medications to manage the symptoms to, to kind of keep me stable. I don't want to be stable I want to find out why I have bipolar and stop having bipolar. But nobody's asking that question. Why am I the only one who's asking why I have bipolar? Like, there's got to be a reason for it. And perhaps if we find out why I have it, we can stop me having it. Yeah. And, of course, they all just went. And so I fired everybody. Everybody. I fired my entire medical team. And I said, I'm going to find out why I'm bipolar because I want to stop the symptoms happening, not just put a Band-Aid on it. I want to find the root cause. And of course, everybody told me, well, you can't cure bipolar and uh, nobody knows why you have it and so on and so on and so on. And But I was like, there has to be a reason. Something caused it. Right. Why am I like this? Is it environmental? Is it chemical? Is it food? Is it genetics? Is it is it a learned? I mean, what is it? So I decided to start with genetics because genetics is finite. Your genetics are what they are. You know, your DNA is what it is. And so I decided if I start with genetics, maybe I'll find some answers. But if I don't, then I'll start trying to unravel, you know, food sensitivities or chemical sensitivities or, or other things. I was very lucky um, because I basically hit the jackpot with the genetics. I did. A, I sent off to 23andMe and got my DNA done. And um, one, there were several. So armed with that, and then I had some food sensitivity testing done. I had an absolute like both legs and both arms drained of blood and had just so many blood tests done they they checked for food sensitivities they checked for 
you know, vitamin levels, mineral levels, chemical sensitivities. I mean, you know me, if there was a test, I had it done. I also, at the same time, was having all this testing done and collecting all that data. At the same time, I bumped into a doctor on Twitter who started following me, which I always, if doctors start following me, I'm always curious. So I went and, and checked out his stuff. In the meantime, I had been writing and publishing um, low-carb recipes and low-carb cookbooks at, at that time. And um, the doctor I met on Twitter was Dr. Ted Naiman, who oh, is yeah. quite famous in the, in the keto world. So uh, I started talking to Dr. Naiman, and uh, I, t I asked him if he would write the forward for one of my books, which he did. And, um, and so we, we just got talking, and I asked him if he knew about genetics, and he said, that's not really my thing, but I'll try and help you. And he said, I think I can help you with your bipolar. So I made an appointment, and I went in to see him as a, as a doctor, and um, he put me on the ketogenic diet. And his reasoning was that the ketogenic diet was started originally, it was, it was for uh, children with epilepsy. It helped them with seizures. It helped them either stop seizures altogether or it really, really reduced seizures. And it was incredibly successful at doing that. And his thinking was that because the medication I was on that was keeping me stable was an anti-seizure medication, maybe the ketogenic diet would have a similar effect for me that it had on preventing children getting seizures. So um, Dr. Naiman put me on the ketogenic diet, and about a month after that, I found a naturopath, and I was armed with all of this data, all the genetics, all the blood tests, um, by the time I actually got an appointment to see her, I'd been on keto for six weeks. So <clears throat> then we looked at all the, the food sensitivities, and I was we took out all the things I was sensitive to, which was almost everything. When we layered keto over the top of what was left, I was actually left with nine foods that I could eat. Oh, my gosh. And so I ate nine things for three months. That was it, just nine foods for three months. And I also, if you know anything about food sensitivities, they're typically caused because you have leaky gut. And if you have leaky gut, you have to rotate. If you constantly eat the same thing over and over again, that will typically make you sensitive to that food. So I had nine things that I could eat, and I had to rotate them. So I had this spreadsheet where every day I'd open it up and go, okay, I'm having hazelnuts for breakfast and I'm having bison for lunch and I'm having, you know, a pork chop for dinner. And that was it. And I rotated everything. So for three months I ate those nine foods. So that was one thing. Um, we did also discover that I had a massive case of leaky gut, so we started working on cleaning my gut. Now, how did, I had they, a massive... how did they diagnose the, the massive leaky gut? Well, I think so. My naturopath was like, if you have that many food sensitivities, you have to have leaky gut oh, okay. because that's how your. So what happens is the because your gut is literally leaky, it has holes, mm -hmm. tiny, tiny gaps in all the the links in your gut. What happens is the food particles don't get properly digested; they float through the the gaps in your gut they show up at the liver and your liver's like you're not digested i have no idea what you are therefore i'm going to throw a hissy fit so i'm going to give you a reaction because you're alien because you're undigested i don't recognize you that in very very you know layman's terms so if you have a lot of food sensitivities you're it, you're going to have a leaky gut right and then I the liver will isn't it that the liver will secrete antibodies to combat that food that it doesn't rec recognize? And then exactly. with all of that, you can develop autoimmune disease pretty easily. Exactly. So, um, and, and the, the allergic for want of the sensitivity reactions will vary from person to person. You know, I mean, I have psoriasis, I have eczema, I have migraines. I mean, just like all of these kind of toxic reactions to this food that your liver just doesn't know what to do with because it doesn't recognize it because it's undigested. 
So I also discovered that I had a massive case of uh, E. coli in my gut. I had a massive gut infection um, that I didn't know I had. Um, so there was all of that going on. But the, the thing that really, really changed my life was in the DNA. We discovered that I have a genetic mutation on one of my genes called the MTHFR oh, yeah. mutation. And that, that several things that that means is one thing is that I do not have the ability to methylate. And methylation is a process that the lots of processes in your body require this process called methylation. And I'm very bad at it because of this genetic wrinkle that I had. Why that's so, so important is that B vitamins, when we ingest B vitamins, they have to be methylated before the body can use them. Well, since I can't methylate, I had this severe deficiency of B vitamins. I'd basically been deficient of B vitamins all my life. It didn't matter how many I ate because they weren't in a form I could use and I couldn't methylate them. I just had no B vitamins. Why that matters is that B vitamins' number one role is neurotransmitter health. So literally, my brain had never had the required nutrients that it needed to function optimally. Wow. We also, we also found that my serotonin and dopamine receptors, which are the, the things that keep you happy, your mood stabilizers, Genetically, my my serotonin and dopamine receptors are broken in about 40 different places. Um, we also discovered that I am genetically intolerant to gluten. And so the gluten had been attacking my brain. It, it, we didn't know that. Um, and another thing that, that people who have MTHFR struggle with is uh, detox. We have most people's liver does a really, really, really good at detoxing. So if there's, there's toxic chemicals or foodstuffs or whatever, the liver detoxifies. That's its job. It does all the cleaning. Well, my liver isn't very good at that because of this MTHFR. I'm not very good at detoxing stuff. So when I am faced with you know, toxic chemicals, VOCs in the house or foodstuffs, you know, ingredients in food that are toxic, all of that, it builds up in my body and I can't get rid of it very well. So my toxic load was huge. So if you add all of those things together, you know, dopamine receptors, serotonin receptors don't work properly. My neurotransmitters had never been nutritionally I'd never been nourished because I was getting no B vitamins. If you add all of that up, it was it was going to happen that at some point my brain was going to go sideways because it simply wasn't getting all the things it needed because of this genetic mutation. So that was the big breakthrough. And so as well as, uh, as doing all the food elimination, so taking out all the things I was sensitive to, cleaning up my E. coli, you know, trying to work on rebuilding the walls of my gut so they were no longer leaky. The key thing we did was that, and I stopped eating gluten, um, the key thing we did was we, I started taking pre-methylated B vitamins. So you can buy them in a form that they are bioavailable to everybody, even those of us that can't methylate. So I'd been eating keto at that point for six weeks. We started doing all this work. We put me on the, the methylated B vitamins. Six weeks after that, um, a combination of those B vitamins and the ketogenic diet, because, of course, my brain was by then being bathed in healthy fats because I was eating a very high-fat diet, the ketones – Three months after I started keto, six weeks after I started the methylated B vitamins, uh, Dr. Naima said, okay, you can come off your Lamotrigine. And I was terrified because I tried to come off my Lamotrigine before 
and and had immediately within 36 hours become suicidal. So I was terrified, and, and he said, you can go to cold turkey, and it's going to be fine, but I wasn't brave enough to do that. And so we cut it in half, and nothing happened, and we cut it in half, and nothing happened, and, and then I came off it. And so about two weeks later, I stopped taking the Lamotrigine. I have been completely unmedicated ever since, and I've had no symptoms of bipolar ever since and that has been um actually i've just passed my third birthday of um no medications and no symptoms so that was a very 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 long answer to who i am <laughs> <laughs> well i have a lot of questions because you said a lot so you went off of the foods and how then for three months and then did you reintroduce one at a time or did you bring them all back or what did you do? I, I didn't I, I didn't bring them all back at once, but I did I over over a while I did start adding more and more. And now I I I still struggle with a bit of leaky gut, I think, because it's weird. So last year, for example, last summer, I randomly became sensitive to lamb. Now, I love lamb, and lamb chops are a fantastic keto dinner because lamb is very fatty. And so I would just, you know, pan, I'd just saute a couple of lamb shoulder chops and call it dinner. Um, because ketogenically, I mean, that's that's keto superfood right there. And because the lamb's very fatty, you don't have to add any fat to it. You just eat that. It's good. And I love lamb. So I ate a lot of lamb. And then one day I noticed that my, my feet and ankles were swelling. But I didn't know why because I was eating a big variety of foods. And then they started swelling to the point where they were so fat I couldn't actually walk. Oh, geez. And I made the mistake of, of, of asking Dr. Google. And, of course, the answer, if you go look it up, is you're going to die. Uh, <laughs> you've either got heart failure, kidney failure, or liver failure. And so, of course, I, I get on email to Dr. Naiman, and I'm like, um, and he's like, okay, come in. And I went in, and he said, I have no idea what this is, but it's not good because if, if your feet and ankles ever swell up like that, it's not good. So he sent me off for some blood tests. In the meantime, because I love now, of course, I love to do the N equals one experiments, I started experimenting. My naturopath said animal protein. So I stopped eating all animal protein. And then I ate a pork chop and nothing happened. And then I tried other meats and nothing happened. And then I ate a lamb chop. Immediately, my feet and ankles swelled up. So I did the experiment another couple of times, and I'm like, I can't eat lamb anymore. So I didn't eat lamb for eight months, and then I tried eating lamb, and now I can eat lamb again. Oh, and so right now, I, I go through this, and I'm actually right now, I can't eat almonds. I also had a period last year where I couldn't eat, suddenly couldn't eat coconut. Um, I ate a bite of something and I, I was developing crock pot recipes and I'd used coconut oil spray to, to grease the crock pot and I'd, I'd cooked this, this dish in the crock pot and I was taste testing it and I took like a bite and all the skin on my lips, it was just, I was like, my lips were on fire for four days. It was this really weird reaction. And then my lips started to peel. Oh, and so wow. I got a Dr. Naiman and he gives me an EpiPen because he's like, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I figured it out that it was coconut. And so for, I don't know, six months, I couldn't eat coconut in any form. Now I can eat coconut and I'm, and I'm fine. Right now it's almonds. <laughs> Wow. So if I eat almonds now, all the skin on my lips falls off. So, do you take probiotics I, or enzymes? I I do take probiotics, um, and and for anyone who's 
thinking about doing that, it is important to rotate them. You don't want to pick one and then just take the same one all the time. So every month you should have like two or three different probiotics, good quality probiotics, and switch them out every month. So you take one and then a different one and then a different one so that you're you're constantly introducing new strains so your body kind of doesn't get used to any one particular thing. But I... Most of, most foods I'm now absolutely fine with, mm. but I am having these like cyclical things with random ingredients. Um, I have no idea what that is, but well, thank God it's... you can recognize it. You know how many people go through that and they they're not in tune with their body enough that they don't even realize. Well, one of the really really great things about going through the process I've been through, where we were kind of like on this massive detox and this this food elimination thing, is your body. You do become very very sensitive, and it becomes super easy to tell what's going on. You you can eat something and go, okay, I've got to stop eating that. I mean, it becomes almost you just become very in tune with your body mm-hmm. when you've done this kind of work. So that. That is super helpful. And what did um, you do to detox? There's there's a lot of things you can do to detox, and that's and that and I have to say that's still a thing. I still you can't clear a whole lifetime of toxins um, in five minutes. So detox is still a huge thing for me, and I know it is because I still have my psoriasis and eczema. It's getting less. But the, the, the eczema and psoriasis are, for me, they are signs that the toxins are still coming out um, because I have a lifetime of stuff in there that I have not been able to clear because my liver's just not good at that because of this genetic mutation. So I'm still working on the detox. Some of my favorite things that, for me, have been very, very effective are uh, magnesium flake and baking soda baths. Um, if you're going to do that, you need to start slowly. Um, I could tell you it's kind of dinner time, so I'm not over here on the East Coast anyway, so I'm not going to revolt you with that story. Um, but I highly recommend if you if you know that you have MTHFR and you need to do some detox or you just want to try it, start with um epsom salt foot baths so you get a bucket of warm water a cup of epsom salts get a book dunk your feet in the bucket for half an hour and then go to bed you always do it before bed epsom that will if you're having trouble sleeping that's also a fantastic way to get a great night's sleep is epsom salts uh foot soap um Then once you've done that for a while, a week or two, you can move up to Epsom salt baths. And when you're used to Epsom salt baths, move to magnesium flakes. Magnesium flakes are much more effective at detoxing than Epsom salts. And then baking soda also helps, but then it also stops your skin from drying out. So adding a cup of baking soda to that helps too. Um, If you're new to detoxing and you have a lot to do if you go too fast you could actually make yourself quite ill the 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 onslaught of dumping toxins into your bloodstream can be quite dramatic so go slow one of my other favorite detox things is far infrared sauna fire infrared sauna is dry sauna um a lot an increasing number of medical facilities have them They use them clinically for heavy metal detox. If your body is is saturated with heavy metals um, like mercury or aluminum or or arsenic, things like that, they use them in a clinical setting to detox heavy metals. They're very, very good at that. I found them really, really good for general detox. So a fire infrared sauna is dry. It's not wet. Um, it's far more effective at detox than a regular wet sauna. A lot of gyms are now starting to install fire infrared saunas in their establishments. So, and I heard about fire infrared sauna. 
from a podcast, a doctor on the East Coast whose name escapes me. But after I heard him talking about heavy metal detox and fire infrared sauna, I kind of got online and went fire infrared sauna, Seattle, where I was living at the time. And um, a local hot yoga studio had six of them, and you could just go book a session. And so they were offering a package of six for like 10 bucks or some crazy wow. thing. So I booked them. So I'm like, I'm going to try them. And I think it was the fourth session. I remember doing the fourth session and I came out and I remember sitting in my car and I just felt better than I'd felt in a really, really, really long time. And so then I was like, okay, well, this has to be a thing for me. And I actually, I, out of curiosity, I went to find out how much they cost. And when I did the math on buying one to have in my house versus continuing to go to the yoga studio, it was a no brainer. So I bought one. It's just a little, it's almost like, you know, you know, the size of a, of a British telephone box, you know, the red, the red telephone boxes, they it's kind of like that. So it's just a little one person sauna. I have it in my garage. And so I bought a fire infrared sauna so I could do that all the time. The other cool thing about fire infrared saunas is you can take your tech in there with you. You can work in there. You can take your laptop in there. You can watch a movie in there. You can, you know, whatever you like. So you can actually multitask in those. So fire infrared sauna is one of my favorite ways to detox. Um, um, there's also all sorts of supplements that will help you detox. But the, the mag flake baths and the fire infrared sauna have been the most successful for mm. me. That's cool to know. But, That's my dream okay. is to get one of those saunas. I am dying for one. What brand did you end up with, Carrie? So I, I did a lot of research, but I actually ended up going with the brand that they had at the hot yoga studio, which is Clearlight. Um and as I understand it, those are the best saunas, fire infrared saunas on the market. They're also the safest in terms of EMF. Now, Clearlight have actually just merged with the brand Jacuzzi. So if you're familiar with that brand, Jacuzzi and Clearlight now are together. So the Jacuzzi, Clearlight, fire infrared saunas are, as I understand it, the best and safest on the market. Okay. And they're not as expensive as you think they are. And it actually made no sense to continue to go to the hot yoga studio to pay. Uh, I think so when I bought mine to continue to go to the hot yoga, yoga studio, which meant, you know, driving there and booking and maybe not being able to go when I wanted and, and all of that. But I think it was like $117 a month for unlimited use. But, of course, you have to book and drive and all of that. Whereas to buy one, I think it was 18 months interest-free credit, it was like $129 a month. But after 18 months, you own it. Yeah. And it was in my garage. And I didn't yeah. have to – I mean, it was just like – No brainer. I'm just going to buy one. So, so that's what I did. And then, of course, I became really, really popular and everybody else came to my house and used it too. And I, <laughs> and I was perfectly happy because, hey, I've got it. You know, you might as well come and make use of it. And so, That's so, cool. Uh, yeah, that was super cool. So I highly recommend Fire Room for Red Sauna. I'm going to have to look up that brand. I'm not familiar with that brand, but I know that, you know, there's so many out there and, you know, there's a lot that have positive things. And then they say, oh, be careful of the glue and the – you know, the finish on them or whatever that right. they could have. But I haven't even gotten that far because my husband's like, yeah, I don't think we can do that. You know, we just got one kid out of college. We have, so we have three kids and finances with their education have been ridiculous. So of course I'm in last place for all the, all the money. So we're coming up to like, I need to kind of, I want to dig deep with you. There's so much I want to talk about. I think we should probably do a part two to this. Um, we can do as many parts as you like. Yeah. I can talk about um, things I've done that have radically improved my health until the cows come home. It's like my favorite thing, and not not because I like talking about me, but because I, I have a huge and altruistic passion for helping other people to get to the place where where I am now. 
And I've uncovered a lot of things that do not seem to be common knowledge out there in the medical world, like MTHFR. I mean, it's becoming more common now, but um, I, when three years ago, it feels like I was the only person talking about this. But when when people find out about it, and they'll, they'll talk to me. I mean, I have hundreds and hundreds of people messaging me or emailing me on a weekly basis, and I can talk to them and I can say, you've got MTHFR, get your DNA done, and every single time they come back, you know, from their symptoms and they have MTHFR and, you know, they start taking methylated B vitamins and they go find themselves either a functional medicine doctor or a naturopath who can help them figure out what else needs to change and their health, the, the the dramatic improvement in their health, it's just like it's it's the best payment for me. And, and and so I recently figured out how to deal with Lyme disease because I've just had Lyme disease and I've just got over Lyme disease. So, I mean, we can do as many parts as you like if it will help yes. someone else to – particularly from a mental health perspective, if, 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 if what I share, what I've learned through my own journey will help people with any kind of mental health issues, then I will talk till the cows come home. And you talk so cutely too. <laughs> <laughs> so what are, so I, I want to kind of close this one and then definitely I want to do a part two. So we're going to have to find a time that we can do another recording. Um, but I'm kind of like at the beginning of all my normal questions that I would say, um, and we know how you found all this. And what, when you got started on keto, were you, you said that you were not eating vegetables. Is that what I heard you say? So you're just doing yeah. the fatty meats? Yes. So when I first went on keto, I was, so to be clear, because most people, at the, keto is very trendy right now. And most people come to keto because they've heard it's good for fat loss, for weight loss. I was not doing keto for fat loss or weight loss. Right. I was doing keto for my brain. And that is very different to doing it for weight loss, weight loss or fat loss. So I do want to be clear that they're different. I was doing what they call therapeutic keto. So the goal for me with Dr. Naiman was to get my ketones as high as possible because for brain health, that has what has been proved with, with children who have seizures. That's what's proved to be the most successful thing. So it's all about super high fat, keeping the ketones levels really, really high. So I was peeing on ketone strips. And my, my goal in life every day was to get dark purple. For most people who are doing keto for fat loss or weight loss, you do not want to do that. You do not need to do that. Getting your ketones super high, getting dark, dark purple on those pea strips is not going to make you lose fat or weight any faster. You, Your goal should be to be in ketosis, but not into deep, 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 deep ketosis like I was. You won't get any extra benefit from that. So, so I just want to be clear that I was doing therapeutic keto for my brain. Yes. I was not doing just regular ketosis for fat and weight loss. So I was eating um, like zero carb uh, fatty meat, essentially. Fatty meat, nuts, eggs, pretty much those kind of things. Okay. Then after we layered the food, then when, once we got the food sensitivity test back, that was reduced to nine things. Um, and eggs was not. I became allergic to eggs. So that was bizarre reaction. Two hours after I ate eggs, all the skin on my feet would peel off. That was really bizarre. But it was, I mean, you, I could test it. I, I mean, easily I could test it. I'd eat an egg skin. I mean, it was just bizarre. Can you eat anyway, it now? I can eat eggs now. Good. I'm good. fine. So I didn't eat eggs for six months and now – and then I started eating one, like, you know, one a week. And then I was fine. And then two. And so I sort of – I don't overdo anything now. I don't go crazy on anything. And I don't eat anything like, you know, three or four days in a row. 
anymore because I've learned that that is the environment in which you can actually create a food sensitivity if you bombard your body with the same thing a lot over and over again in a short space of time you can actually develop a sensitivity so I'm much more moderate about everything now eggs I can eat but at the time when we laid the food sensitivities onto my keto I as I say I was left with those nine things. Luckily, pork was one of them. Thank you. Um, um, but I couldn't eat beef. I couldn't eat chicken. I'm trying to remember what I was left with. I could eat duck, lamb, bison, pork. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other five the other five things were. Uh, nuts. I know hazelnuts was one. I can't remember the other four things I could eat. I think maybe there was a fish in there somewhere. But basically, yeah, that's what I ate for, for three months. But as I say, I was doing therapeutic keto. So my goal was super high ketones, dark pea strips. That so what should percentage, not be most people's goal. Is that like 80% fat, would you say? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and yeah. most people are like about 70%, right, or less? Yeah, well, 80 or 90 for me. I mean, it was really like – and Dr. Naiman, he has he has a lot of people who he puts on keto. In fact, almost everybody that walks into his clinic with any issue is probably going to be put on keto. Um, and he has most people on a one-to-one, so same amount in grams – the same amount of protein grams as fat grams. And he finds that for most people, that is brilliant for fat loss and weight loss. So the same amount of grams as fat every day. So if you're eating 100 grams of protein a day, 100 grams of fat, you're good. I was kind of doing like three to one. Mm. So for every one gram of protein, three grams of fat. Okay. But that was therapeutic keto, and the goal was not weight loss. Are you still on that ratio? No. I um, I, I'm probably about one and a half to one okay. now. So you cut it in half. Um, so, yeah, I probably cut it in half now. Okay. But... As I say, as I indicated um, a little while ago, I've had some other issues, none of which are related to keto, because I contracted Lyme disease, and Lyme disease, boy howdy, messes with everything in your body. So I've had other things going on, and um, and I've also made some more genetic uh, mut- mutation discoveries about my body, which maybe we could share in another episode. Um, okay. where my body actually has a different dietary requirement than my brain. Um, so that has complicated my life somewhat, and I'm still trying, we're still trying to figure out what that should look like. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so I want to hear all about that. You need to message me some times that we can record part two because I want them to be back-to-back if possible. Um, I'm really looking for Otherwise, everybody stories. will be going mad because they all want to know. <laughs> Right, right. They do because they want to be, they want to feel healthier. And that's the whole focus of this show is to show people all the possibilities that can happen. So, and um, yeah, so I just want to thank you so much for coming on today. Message me some times that we can re record so we can have part two and part one, like just back to back so that people aren't, you know, dying to know the answers. And I might actually run them simultaneously so that people can hear it. I think um, I think my main message here is that whatever it is is that's wrong with you, it, there's hope. There, particularly, and my focus is always going to be mental health because I spent most of my life in a living hell with various levels of depression, with bipolar, with suicidal ideation, with actively trying to kill myself. With I mean, you know, that has been the majority of my life and when I look back or when I look at the life I have now with the life I had for most of my life I just want people to know that there is hope 
that you you do not, I do not believe, I mean, there may be some people for whom this is an exception, but I no longer believe that having a mental health issue is a life sentence, that you just have to sit there and try and manage to have a somewhat decent life, either highly medicated or just going through periods where you can't cope or, you know, whatever, because the life I have now is is a completely different life to the life I had before I started doing this, before I became my own detective and started ans- asking questions and digging into my own DNA and 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 working with people who were interested in finding root cause as yeah. opposed to treating symptoms. Yeah, uh, my life now is completely different. I mean, I, I, I now I created a life I love. I had to do a lot of work, but boy, was it worth it. When I compare my life now to the majority of my life where I was dealing with this wonky brain all the time, it, it's like day and night. So I just want people to know that there's hope and it will take you some work and it will take you finding the right person to help you. But I believe that, For most people with mental health issues, you do not have to suffer anywhere near as much as you are right now. Yeah, amen to that. I I love hearing that. And that actually is how we're going to continue next time because um, I really truly feel just based on experiences in my family that mental health is just such a big issue in our country. It's not being taken care of. And um, that's why we have all this stuff that happens and um, we need to really address it and, and destigmatize it as, you know, the d- imbalance that it is. Like, we don't stigmatize people with cancer. So why are we going to stigmatize people with mental health disorders? I, I think people are scared of people with mental health disorders. Um, there is a massive stigma still. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, 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 it's true. It shouldn't be. But it's true that if you say out loud you have bipolar, you could easily lose your job. Yeah. Or you could easily just never be able to get a job. Like you can be ostracized by your family. You can be, I mean, it's just, and, and, and that's the reality. So we all know there shouldn't be a stigma, but there is a massive stigma to any kind of mental mental illness. And, and as in my case, it's not going to be the same for everybody. In my case, the, the majority of this was this, this MTHFR mutation, that genetic mutation. I was born with this, right? None of this was me, my fault. You know, I'm, I'm not broken in that way. I'm not crazy. I just had a genetic wrinkle that made it impossible for my brain to function in the way that most people does. We shouldn't be any more stigmatized by that than someone who has diabetes. Right. Totally agree. Totally. And, and, and yet we are. And life is very, very difficult if you have a mental health issue. But I, I absolutely, and, and there's too many, there's way too many people dying needlessly. There's, 853 people in the U.S. alone will kill themselves this week. And another 20,000 people in the U.S. will try and kill themselves this week. That's 20,853 people too many. Yeah. And we have to do something about it. Yeah, I agree. And we're not all crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I've got to, I've got to close out. My computer battery is actually at 14%. <laughs> hey, listen, thank you, girl. We'll, we'll talk soon. Okay. All right. I'm going to press the pause and then I do have to head out. Um, where is my thingy? But, um, yeah, let me know when you can keep going because this, your story is just, it's like, I love it. I love it. And I know that a lot of people need to hear it. So I really, really, really wanted to tell you, thank you. I appreciate you. And let me know, like, give me three times that work that we can record part two. Please. Okay. please. I will, yeah, 
I will. I, I'm going to take Sarah. We're going to go eat, and then I will come back. I will shoot you a bio, and then I will send you some times. Okay, baby. Thank you. Thank you. And thank I, will, you. I will not go to sleep tonight until I've done that. And Sarah is my witness. She's going to make me do it. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> she says she can't hear you. She says hi. <laughs> Wow. Okay. That was awesome. And I don't want to say much because I just want you to stay tuned for part two. Please head on over to iTunes, subscribe to the podcast and give us a review and a rating because that always helps people find the show. If you know anybody who'd be a great guest, please send them my way and email me at Tracy at highenergygirl.com. That's Tracy with two E's. Just in case you didn't know, go out and make it a great day.